It started out as a random probation check on this elderly petty thief. It was like walking into a horror film. Here's a guy in his late 70s, and he spends his time setting up mannequins in lingerie. But it's not only corpses that attract necrophiles. He drew the line down her nylons to make it look like it was a seam. Charm was his greatest weapon. Dozens upon dozens of women suffered. This was the most complicated case that I ever investigated. We're dealing with a monster of some sort. To what magnitude, we had no idea. She was thrown away like she was a piece of garbage. They had found my mother in a black plastic bag. Then we found the list of 10. I was an investigator in some shape or form for 26 years. I traveled all over the state of Nevada doing major crimes investigations. Back in December of 2008, an older man named Joseph Naso went to the city of South Lake Tahoe in California and was caught attempting to exit a supermarket with a shopping cart full of alcohol and groceries. So the judge sentenced him to a year on probation. We are sitting in front of the house that Joseph Naso was living in and serving out his probation. In February 2010, Mr. Naso had his case transferred to a new probation officer. And on April 13th, 2010, Officer Wesley Jackson makes an unannounced visit to Mr. Naso's home. As Officer Jackson moves through the house, he discovers two rooms. That are locked with metal hasps and padlocks from the outside. This arouses Jackson's suspicion that Mr. Naso is hiding something in there that he shouldn't have. He demands access to the room, and Mr. Naso gets very defensive, will not tell him where the keys are to open the padlocks. This would be a violation of the terms of his probation. So Officer Jackson placed Mr. Naso into handcuffs, and during his search of Mr. Naso's person, he found a bullet and a newspaper classified ad for the private sale of a handgun in the same caliber as the bullet that was found. This would have been another probation violation. So Jackson placed Mr. Naso into custody. Jackson then calls additional officers to the scene to help him do a thorough search of Mr. Naso's possessions. And that's when this whole thing started for me. When I arrive at the scene, we had to go through the fence into the backyard because Mr. Naso had the front door boarded shut. I walked into the kitchen, it smelled of trash. 
The living room was completely dark. The home is so cluttered, piles of newspaper, writings, calendars, going back years. We found business cards, Joseph Naso photography. There were black and white photos of himself posing with a camera. We find stacks of true crime novels and magazines depicting women bound and gagged in various states of undress. There was one cover showed what appeared to be a deceased woman, and it was titled, Be My Sex Slave or Be My Corpse. We found a set of keys to open the two locked rooms. There were mannequins. Mannequins in the closet, in corners. Mannequins were all headless. Some of them were just legs. We found legs in suitcases. You'd open a suitcase and there'd be two legs in it. It was just extremely strange. What kind of person does this? It got even worse when we went into his garage. There are approximately 10 mannequins dressed in hosiery, ladies' panties, garter belts. One of them appears to be hanging from a noose. Think about how creepy that is. I mean, here's a guy from his late 70s, and he spends his time setting up mannequins in a garage in this remote house in the Nevada desert and dressing them in lingerie. But the mannequins were just the start of it. Every room in the house had stacks of photographs, thousands of photographs of women of various ages, and almost all of them some type of hosiery, like fishnet stockings or stockings with a seam running up the back of the leg. These were soft porn images of women, women in different state of undress, some naked bondage sometimes, that sort of thing. But there's uh, one thing that really got investigators' attention. There were a number of pictures of women that appeared to be either unconscious or deceased at the time that he had taken the pictures of them. And there were thousands. Everything in the house up to this point is weird and creepy and disturbing, but none of it is clearly criminal. On a small dining table, I found a metal clipboard that has storage in it for reports or forms. And on this metal folder are multiple pages handwritten by Mr. Naso. And it's listing after listing dozens of accounts, Naso's own words, of women that he sexually assaulted. They were categorized by year, the 1950s, 1960s, 1970s, and so forth. Selena, Kansas, girl I've met at Fred Astaire's dance studio. She was gorgeous, great legs and nylons, heels, had to rape her in my car on a cold, wintry night. 47 Mercury, he lists the car that he was driving. Butte girl, I picked up in Colonial House on Main Street. She was only 17. 
I took her up to a hotel room, got her drunk. I put it to her good, 1958. The girl I met on the bus going to Kansas City from a very pretty girl I picked uh, up at dance. Call? Girl in Buffalo. Girl I followed, yeah. I picked up hitching, yeah, gave once. me a good BJ, and put it to her in the front seat, got her drunk, and gave her a real good screw, and had to rape her on the ground, had to force her on the front seat. She cried, but I didn't. I loved it. This later became described as the rape diary. Based on all of the items that I'm seeing in this house, the photography, the writings, the mannequins, I believe that at a minimum, we're looking at a serial rapist. It started out as a random probation check on this elderly petty thief. And once they got into the house, it just turned into a, really a horrific scene. And then they came upon one last item. A small piece of paper had been found, and it's handwritten, and there are 10 entries on it with vague references to places and no names. It's almost like a shopping list, something to help them remember. The first entry is girl near Heldsburg, Mendocino County, girl near Port Costa, girl near Loganitas, lady from 839 Leavenworth. He has just girl, 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 lady, girl, girl. But when I actually try to tally it against the rape diary, I can't find any entries that correspond with these particular entries in this small notepad. Were these women he planned to hurt? Women he knew? Women he'd already hurt? We had no idea. And there were 10 entries, which we referred to as the list of 10. And it just right off the get-go, it was a sense of, we're dealing with a predator, a monster of some sort. To what magnitude, we had no idea. The list of 10 opened Pandora's box. I've searched a lot of residences, worked a lot of cases from homicides to sexual assaults, and I've never witnessed anything like this. It was just strange and eerie. The mannequins dressed in lingerie, the true crime novels, the rape diary, it kind of painted a picture that we could be dealing with a, a, a potentially uh, prolific sex offender. And there's a list of 10. We did not know what the list was. Is it just the ramblings of an old man? One to 10, girl from here with a location, and they don't know what it is. It was clear that it was a massive undertaking to try to track down all of Naso's victims. We're up against an investigation that could take us into other states, clear across the country, once we um, realized we've got something major here, we began forming the NASO task force. This was the most involved, complicated case that I ever investigated. When the Nevada Department of Public Safety executed their search warrants, they removed thousands of photographs and documents that we considered evidence. I think, honestly, the only thing we left at Joe Naso's house was the refrigerator. A 
couple of days after Mr. Naso was arrested, he receives a visitor in the Washoe County Jail who is his ex-wife, Judith Naso. They were divorced, but they were still very friendly and in close contact because of Charles or Charlie, their youngest son. And the visit was recorded. During the, the visit, Mr. Naso tells Mrs. Naso that he has things that the police cannot find, and I want you to get it for me. Mr. Naso instructs her to have Charlie break into the house and get specific items that were in his dresser drawer, and they were his safety deposit box keys. Mrs. Naso refuses to do this, and Mr. Naso gets upset with her and yells at her. That was the starting point for us on another search warrant, and we found the safety deposit box keys. They were able, through other documents in the house, discover which banks these de safe deposit boxes were located. In one box, the first box, they discovered $152,000 in cash. The next search warrant um, was just a couple blocks away at the Wells Fargo Bank. Inside the safety deposit box, we discovered photographs and newspaper articles mounted on cardboard. And the photographs were of a woman who appeared to be unconscious or dead. And on the flip side, there was a newspaper article from Yuba County, California, about a Yuba County lady that had been found murdered, a woman named Pamela Parsons. The article in the safety deposit box had the headline, Foul Play Suspected in Linda Woman's Death. Linda is a very small community here in Yuba County. At the time, Naso lived just across the county line in Yuba City. And on the list of 10 that was found in Naso's pocket, it refers to the girl from Linda. That was our first big lead, and now shifts my thinking to, is this potentially a list of murder victims rather than rape victims? I remember seeing those photographs they found and in one, Pamela was lying across a sofa, and she was nude. And uh, she appeared to be either pretending to be deceased or deceased. And then a similar photograph was on the bed. And she was lying on her back with her arms out and her feet out. And uh, her eyes were closed. And she appeared to be either deceased or incapacitated. During the search of his home, we found poster boards stacked up in the bedroom. And on those poster boards, I saw other photographs of Pamela Parsons. It was obvious that she was posing. In some of the photographs, she was completely nude, but mostly scantily clad. So she was wearing lingerie, negligees, or panties, and stockings. Naso had a fetish for the old style nylon um, where the seam ran down the back. And so if he took a photograph and they didn't have it on there, he would take a Sharpie or some kind of pen and he would draw it in on the photograph. A prime example is Pam Parsons. She has a photograph where she's leaning over a dresser. He took the ink pen and he drew the line down her uh, nylons to make it look like it was a seam in the nylons. I was two years old when she passed away. I knew that she was gone. I didn't know how, but I just knew that she was gone. My uncle was the closest with her because they're 14 months apart. And he said that she was his best friend, a tomboy. She liked frogs and salamanders. Just really funny and, you know, vivacious. That's kind of the picture I got of her. What's the word? Charismatic. So she probably had you know, attracted people, like wrong kind of people. She was very photogenic, just gorgeous, you know, dark hair, brown eyes. I think she knew she was beautiful. The 
September 15th, 1993, Pamela Parsons' live-in boyfriend called the Sheriff's Department to report her missing. And then on the 19th, a passerby, this is a very rural area, uh, reported finding a body uh, out near some orchards on Simpson Lane in Yuba County. And that body was ultimately identified as Pamela Parsons. Pamela was nude. She was lying on her back. She had ligature marks around her throat. It was something thin that was around her neck. It could have been a wire. It could have been a rope. It could have been pantyhose. If he killed Pamela Parsons, he got away with it for decades. One of the areas that we focused on, Mr. Naso kept calendars. We sent copies to the Yuba County Sheriff's Office. Just the calendar that you would pick up at Ace Hardware. Photograph on one side, uh, the days and the months with very small squares, and he would write in the small squares for that day. And anything significant that happened, you know, uh, throughout his day. Visited my son, went to the flea market, if he got a phone call from someone, he logged it in there. If he met an attractive woman that day, he would document it there somehow. Sometimes very pretty. He was very meticulous and very concerned with writing those things down and documenting his daily activities. We went through all of these calendars. Pamela Parsons was last seen on September 15, 1993. We looked at the dates around her disappearance and ultimate death. There is an entry, um, September 15th, and the entry says, got even on an old score. On that calendar, as we start moving back in time, we find the date we believe he meets Pamela. It was like two weeks before she disappeared. She had told my aunt she was approached by somebody that was going to photograph her. And she was excited about it. She was always kind of into her looks, and she also was aging, though. So, you know, to have a photographer come up to you when you're 34 and tell you you're beautiful, my aunt tried to talk her out of it. She told her that was crazy and not safe, and but my mom was stubborn. The entry on his calendar describes a photo shoot of some kind. He indicated in his own writing that he had been with her for about four hours. He describes meeting her, talks about her being pretty, having nice legs. He refers to her as a hitchhiker. And at the end of that entry, he says, she stole from me. Which led us to believe that he had taken out his anger or revenge um, on Pamela Parsons for stealing whatever she'd stolen from him. Finding those entries on that calendar in relation to Pamela Parsons was a huge step forward. Number nine on the list of 10, without a doubt in our minds, is Pamela Parsons. And she is the girl from Linda. When we were able to correlate the photograph and newspaper articles from the safety deposit box to entry number nine on the list, my reaction was, oh shit. We may have stumbled into a serial killer. If he killed Pamela Parsons, in my mind, that means he could have killed all 10 women on the list. We have gone from a person who is going to get a slap on the wrist for probation violation to a person that is potentially a, a serial killer. At this point, we're determined to make a case against Naso in at least the murder of Pamela Parsons, but potentially nine more on the list of 10. Right now, we're headed northbound B Street in the city of Marysville. 
as well as the photos found in the uh, safety deposit box. There was a second set of articles from the Appeal Democrat, which is the local newspaper at the time in 1994, that made reference to a body found dumped off the side of the road just outside the city of Marysville, named as being Tracy Tafoya. But they were not able to establish a cause of death. It was undetermined in the original autopsy. It was an open case. It was uh, a case that had been worked by our detectives to no avail, and they were never able to make an arrest or put closure to it. Number 10 on the list of 10 referred to girl from MRSB, which we understand is Marysville, with the parentheses cemetery. The question was, is Tracy DeFoya number 10? We started contacting uh, different friends of hers, family members. Tracy Tafoya is my younger sister. She was born 10 years after I was. She was like a little doll. And I babied her. We were real close. She was outgoing even as a kid. She must have been about three years old. And she went in and got change out of her dad's pocket and got her tricycle and rode around the block to the neighborhood store and banged on the door till the lady opened it and said, I'm here to buy candy, Elsie. And it was in the middle of the night. She was in the paper and everything. She almost always had a smile on her face. She loved to dance and play country music. Even as a grown-up, she was still like a little kid. She got married real young and then started having babies. Boom, one right after the other, you know. She had four kids, two girls and two boys, until her husband took the kids and ran off with them. He loaded those kids up in the car and off they went, and we've never seen or heard a word from them again. And she met Rick, and uh, she fell in love and got married. And she got pregnant real quick. And, you know, she had the baby. She was happy with her new life, and she was tickled to death with that baby. The next thing I know, I get this phone call from my brother telling me that the baby had died. He was 30 days old. And they said it was SIDS, and that was it. That's when she snapped. It was all over then. Kerr and Rick split up, and she stayed with Mom for a little bit. But, you know, she needed to do something to get money coming in, and so that's why she became a prostitute. She promised my mom that she'd call her every night no matter what and let her know she was, she was okay. My mom called me and she said that something's happened to Tracy. Said she didn't call me last night. And I said, well, mom, maybe she's still with this person or something and she just can't get to you. Later, she called me and said they found a female body. I just know it's her. She was crying, and she said, Rick's going down there to see if it's her. I wasn't at work maybe 15 minutes when I got the phone call from my mom, and she was crying, and I started crying. I said, it's her, isn't it? She said, yes. We're here on the east side of northbound Highway 70, just outside the city of Marysville. Pamela Parsons' body was discovered probably a couple miles from here. This is the location where the body of Tracy DeFoy was found August 14th of 1994, just over the embankment, uh, several feet uh, lying on the side of the embankment in the grass. They said that she was totally nude. There was no clothes on her. And I think that was the hardest thing to live with, is that she was, I'm sorry, she was thrown away like she was a piece of garbage, you know? And she was, she was a human being. I don't know how long she had been down there in that levee, but 
I read the coroner's report, and she was pretty well decomposed. At the time, it was August. The temperature was very hot, and her body was, it was almost mummified, and it made, made identification very difficult for us. The facial recognition was out of the question. Rick had to identify her. She had one finger that was missing down to about here. She blew it off with a cherry bomb. I guess he told him about her finger, and then he had to see her body to identify her. And I know that had to be horrible for him, being her husband, you know, not knowing what happened to her. It was the hardest for me. We're near the Marysville Cemetery, probably about 150 yards behind us. Girl, Marysville, MRSV, and cemetery. This would be the location tying Tracy Tafoya to that list of 10. I remember the day Wendell and I were driving down from Reno. When this case started, we made trips to Reno, to Tahoe, all over the place on a daily basis. I remember driving home late one night. As uh, Joe Million was driving the vehicle, I was reading Jason's journals in the passenger seat. We went through thousands and thousands of papers, just trying to narrow it down and uncovering any information that linked Tracy to him. The window's thumbing through the 1994 calendar, and he gets to the date of August 6th, which we knew was the day of her missing. He's like, you're never going to believe it. Joe Naso puts Saturday PM, met Tracy, put it to her. And that's a term that we found he used a lot, put it to her, meaning he had sex with somebody or he raped somebody. When he told me that, I mean, still right now, I'm getting chills. That was the link. That's what we needed to tie him in to the area and to her. But we couldn't prove that he killed Pamela Parsons and he killed Tracy Tafoya beyond a shadow of a doubt. We never came up with that smoking gun. Both cases were circumstantial at best. We were having problems getting over that hump past into enough probable cause. There's no DNA evidence that was going to directly connect him. When Mr. Naso appeared in front of the judge for his probation violation, the judge sentenced him to a true year in jail. That let us know, OK, we have a year to try to put this together. We knew we had a long ways to go. We desperately needed to start identifying other women on that list of 10. If we are not able to build a case against him, his only crime at that point was his probation violation. So once that one year sentence was up, he's free to go. Sergeant Million from Yuba County and I were there at the Washoe County Jail to interview him. Nay, so. What we were hoping to obtain from that ultimately is a confession or more to connect him to any of the victims, not just the Yuba County victims. We we're hoping just to get him to talk, have him maybe identify some of the women and admit to knowing Pam Parsons and Tracy Tafoya. If he would even admit to having contact with him, that was one more substantial piece of circumstantial evidence that ties him to them, other than just writings, other than just photographs. He initially believes that we are investigating his probation violations. He agreed to speak with us without counsel present because he said he knows more than the lawyers do. I've studied the law. I know more than those lawyers that you'd have come in here do. 
Typically when offenders do that, it's because they are stupid or paranoid. Uh, in his case, I don't think it's either of those. I think he did partly for the narcissistic reason that he thought he could do better than others, partly for the not untrue reason that he believed he could be charming. Charm was his greatest weapon. And charm and charisma were an important part of his MO. I've always said charm and charisma are two warning signs. These are warning signs of predatory behavior. If somebody is charming and charismatic, don't marry him and don't give him money. I was trying to figure out how I was going to build a rapport with Naso. Some of the photography and magazines that we saw in Mr. Naso's house were pinup art, um, similar to the type of art that was painted on fighter planes in World War II bombers. So I devised a little story that my grandfather, who actually did serve in World War II, collected the same type of nose cone art, pinup girl art, and he had it displayed in his garage. And my cousins and I were not allowed to go in the garage because my grandmother didn't want us to see them. None of this was true other than the fact that my grandfather served in World War II, but it helped establish enough of a relationship between he and I where Mr. Naso started talking and bragging about his prowess with women and how smooth he was. He was confident, curious, and then as he got to talking, he was a braggart. To be honest with you, it wasn't too hard to build Joe Naso's ego. He loves to feel important and loves people to say, hey, you're the best photographer I've ever seen, whether you think of that or not. I had a group of, of photographs of different women. This is him taking these photographs. We started off with pictures of women that were obviously posing. And he would describe to us, oh, yes, yeah, I remember her. She modeled for me out in the woods. And then he talked about how he would get women to pose for him. Mixed in there was one of the photographs of Pam Parsons. Once we got down to Pamela Parsons' picture, appearing dead, draped over this couch, he said that, that she was just posing as a murder victim, and he was that talented that he could make it look like she was dead and he bragged about his talent as a photographer. Ask him how he knew her, refer to her, oh yeah, she has nice legs, she was a hitchhiker, which matched the writings that he had in the calendar. He absolutely acknowledged that he knew her. After about five and a half hours, it kind of got to the point where we needed to really try to nail him down to something, and Sergeant Million um, kind of took the reins there. The last thing we tried to do with him is try and see if we could take a monster and tug on his heartstrings. I had tried to explain to him, while you may have viewed these women as prostitutes and drug addicts, they had children and they had families and they have a right to know what happened. And for a second, he stopped and just kind of stared. And then it wasn't short after that. Um, I, I had put some pressure on him and said, you know what, these women are deceased and you were the last one to be with them, I believe is at your hands. And he stopped the interview at that time. He admitted to his connection to Pamela Parsons that he'd photographed her and that she had stolen from him. So we had him connected to her, but he didn't admit to killing her. It really hadn't changed a whole lot in the overall picture because we didn't have much more than we started with. So we knew we still had a whole lot of legwork left to go. In the second safety box, there's a small purse or wallet, like a clutch type thing, that has identification and business cards from various businesses in Texas. The identification is a Texas driver's license in the name of Sarah Dillon, and there's a US passport also in the name of Sarah Dillon. In the safety box, there was a newspaper article about Bob Dillon, but it referenced Sarah Dillon. That sends off warning bells. It's another oh moment. Could this guy have killed or raped 
Bob Dylan's wife. I don't even know if Bob Dylan is married. In the 80s, Chippendales was so popular. We were a multi-million dollar business. But the bigger we got, the more the problems piled up. So you've been shot right through the head. Wait, what? Curse of the Chippendales, streaming September 24th, exclusively on Discovery+. Plus. We will put ourselves on the line to answer anybody's call for help. Did you hear that? If you want to push me, push me. Oh my God. Ghost Adventures. Every episode ever on Discovery Plus. I'm taking control of Halloween Wars. World class cake and sugar artists will compete. Witness the scariest season yet. I like creepy. Halloween Wars. Stream now on Discovery Plus. I have a set of lungs for you. How crazy is that? We take care of sick patients on death's doorstep. Keep up and keep up and off. Is this heart going to start? Last Chance Transplant. Streaming now on Discovery Plus. What, what are we going to do about this? I was assigned to do the investigation into the Sarah Dillon lead. I had started off with internet searches to determine if Sarah Dillon, Bob Dillon's wife, was alive and okay. I was able to find articles that indicated that she may still be alive and living in Southern California. I then contacted the Los Angeles Police Department. They told me that it was not the Sarah Dillon, Bob Dillon's wife, and they put me in contact with Bob Dillon's manager who had informed them there was a woman they referred to as a groupie that followed them, Bob Dillon and his band, around the world, and she had legally changed her name to Sarah Dillon. When I contact the business in Texas and learn that Sarah Dillon has worked for them, they are acquainted with the family and got me in contact with the Sarah Dillon's brother. He told me his sister had been missing since 1992, had never been heard of again, and then explained to me that she was actually adopted. Her name had been Renee Shapiro. She dropped out of college, changed her name to Sarah Dillon legally, and then took off gallivanting around the world following Bob Dylan. I went on Facebook and got into a Bob Dylan fan group. I made some connections with a couple of gentlemen on the list, and they told me that they had a friend who was named Sarah Dillon that they would travel to concerts with, but she suddenly disappeared in 1992. They had last seen her at a concert in Hawaii, and they expected to see her at the next set of concerts in the West Coast, and they never saw or heard from her again. In the safety deposit box, um, amongst the possessions we believed were Sarah Dillon's was a business card, and on the back of the business card was written May 2nd, 1992, Warfield Theater. And this was the date of one of two performances at that venue in San Francisco for Bob Dylan. The handwriting on it appeared familiar. It appeared to be the same as other entries we'd seen in other things of Mr. Naso. There was no match in the CODIS system as to the DNA that we'd received from the birth mother. Sarah had just disappeared. When the lead tying to Sarah Dillon goes cold, the evidence from the second safety deposit box is pretty much played out. We have identified two victims that correlate with items number nine and 10 on the list of 10. We've identified that there is a missing person in Sarah Dillon, but at that point, that evidence has been exhausted for leads.
We started to look to the other eight entries on the list. Uh, naturally, we started at number one, girl from Heldsburg or Healdsburg, Mendocino County. We contacted the Mendocino County Sheriff's Office, and they weren't able to relate any cases to that one. The next entry on the list is a girl from Port Costa. I started searching on the internet and found Port Costa in Contra Costa County, California. And then we contacted their agency, and there was a case from 1978. A uh, California Highway Patrolman was driving along a county road between the town of Martinez to the town of Port Costa. And it goes along a very wooded and brush area and he smells a heavy scent of decomposition. Initially, he thought it was a dead animal, and then when he started looking around, he found the body of Carmen Cologne. Naso lived in Oakland at the time. Because of the location of the body, it was a body dump, they considered it a homicide. The pathologist took fingernail scrapings and cut the fingernails off. Although DNA analysis had not been discovered at that period of time, that would have been 78. The purpose of the scrapings were to try to determine if there was a possible blood type that could be related later to a possible suspect. We were able to extract DNA from those fingernail clippings, uh, DNA that was on the inside of the fingernails, that was entered into the system. That could be the key to cracking this case. Joe Naso's pattern from the beginning has always been the same, of luring women into a situation whether he tries to be kind and befriend them so they feel comfortable with him, and then at some point, he attacks them. And then when he's done with the attack, he's either dumped them off or moved on to another victim. I am the youngest daughter of Carmen Colon. She was 17 when she had me. I was four years old when my mother passed away. But I don't remember what she looked like. This is the only picture I have of her. When she was young, she was a teenager, 12. I have very little memories of her. But I remember right before she died, my sister and I dressed up and played pretend. and. My mom dressed us up as if we were having a wedding. And when she married us, she made us, my sister and I promise to always take care of one another. I remember that day as vividly as if it was yesterday. She had dropped us off at the babysitters and the adults started talking about my mother not showing up to pick us up. I instantly knew something was wrong. Even at four years old, I knew that we had a pattern and that it had been broken and that it was never going to be the same again. I knew my mom wasn't coming home. When my mother was murdered, she was considered just one more prostitute off the street. That it didn't matter. She wasn't worth our time. And she should have mattered. But she was a person. She was a daughter. She was a mother. She was a sister. But I found out this goes way back to when Joseph Naso was accused of rape by several women when he was in New York. In the 50s, 
He was charged with rape, but given three years probation. He didn't go to prison. After the rape charge, he went into the Air Force. And after he came out of the Air Force in 1958, he was charged again with attempted rape. Not prosecuted, but he pled guilty to sexual battery. And instead of them prosecuting him, they kicked him out of the state of New York to be somebody else's problem, another state's problem. So he moves to Oakland, California. And in 1961, Joe Naso picked up a UC Berkeley student at a bus stop in downtown Oakland. He stops an officer a ride. The victim agrees. He takes her home. And then a few days later, she again is at this bus stop. And Joe Naso comes by, and he picks her up again. And she feels that it was safe the first time. There's no problem. Uh, she gets in the car. And at which time he says, uh, well, let's go for a drink. So he takes her to a bar. They have a few drinks. And then she starts to get a headache. And so he takes her to a residence in Oakland and says, uh, let me get you some medication for your headache. She says, no, that's OK. He comes out. He has a pill in his hand. He forces it into her mouth, and she swallows it. She's becoming woozy and believes that he has drugged her now, and she's trying to get out of the car. He drags her into the back seat of the car and starts choking her. She remembers seeing stars and thinking that she's going to die. He then rapes her. No charges are filed. The detective involved in the case didn't believe the victim's story. He thought that she had made it up to make her boyfriend jealous. He had another sexual assault he committed on a female in Oakland. He got her intoxicated and sexually assaulted her in the backseat of his car. She was embarrassed, didn't want to tell her husband, who also knew Joe Naso. And then after they reported it two or three days later, the police didn't believe her that it was a legitimate sexual assault, unfortunately. They said there was too much doubt that she waited too long to report it. If the women that reported him were believed, they could have stopped all the murders that happened. My mother could still be alive. I believe that if he'd been prosecuted for the rape in 1961, that the list of 10 would not exist, and those 10 women would still be alive today. DNA was entered into the system, we were informed that a match had been made to Mr. Naso's DNA, but it was just a partial match, so it could have been Mr. Naso or any male relative. It wasn't enough evidence to convince a district attorney to take this to trial. Several of weeks into the investigation, we've discovered something strange with the victims that we've identified. And it's that the same letter starts the first name, it starts the last name. Pamela Parsons, Tracy Tafoya, Carmen Colon. And one of the task force members recalls a number of cases in Rochester, New York, called the Alphabet Killings because the victims, the girls, and they were young girls, also had the same type of names. In fact, there was an actual Carmen Cologne in that case also.
this really piqued our interest because Rochester, New York is where Mr. Naso was from. These cases occurred in the 70s, and he'd moved to California in the 60s. But we were looking through his diaries to see if we could place him in any of the areas where these victims were found. And we discovered he had traveled back to see family a number of different times in the 70s. That very clearly could mean that Naso's victims went beyond the list of 10. And if we are not able to build a case against him, once he serves his sentence in El Dorado County, he's out a free man. During the investigation, we realized the names of the victims had the same initials, Carmen Colon, CC, Pam Parson, PP, Tracy DeFoya. We got very excited, um, hoping that we could connect him to those particular murders. We contacted the main agency there in Rochester and sent them a sample of Mr. Naso's DNA. But ultimately, he was eliminated based on DNA. We determined there was no relationship at all between those murders and the ones we had in California. The first name, last name, having the same initials. That all happened just to be coincidence from what we were able to determine. That left us with the remaining entries on the list of 10 to investigate and try to make cases for. We only have very vague references to geographical areas in California. And we started off with the Marin County Sheriff's Office. On the list of 10, number four was Girl on Mount Tam. We had a case uh, that seemed really promising. I think it was from 1977. A girl who lived in the SF Bay area and was last seen uh, telling her friends that she's going to meet a photographer that she met on Fisherman's Wharf. And she was never seen alive again. Her body was found on Mount Tam a few days later. A girl going to meet a photographer seemed like a good match for Naso. Unfortunately, we didn't have the kind of forensic evidence to do DNA testing on, much like the Yuba cases, but really nothing to make a DNA comparison against to link Naso to the crime. Girl from Miami near Down Peninsula. Girl from Berkeley. Lady from 839 Leavenworth. Girl in Woodland near Nevada County. At this point, these didn't really mean anything to any of the detectives we were working with at other agencies. That left number three. Third entry on the list of 10 states the girl from Loganitas. He actually misspelled the word, and the actual name is Loganitas. Loganitas is a very small town, and we had no open homicide cases in our list from that area. But from there, we kind of expanded the boundary to the next few towns over. And the first open homicide case to stand out was the 1977 case of Roxanne Rogash, whose body was found outside the town of Fairfax in uh, January of 1977, probably less than 10 miles or so from the town of Lagunitas. Roxanne was my sister. We didn't have the same mother and father, but we were sisters in every sense of the word. The memories that I have of Roxine, I think I buried a lot of them because of the trauma that happened. She was killed when she was 18. We were close as kids growing up. At one point when we were younger, my parents used to dress us like twins. I always hated it. I mean, we did not look like twins <laughs> by any stretch of the imagination. She had red hair and freckles. <laughs> A lot of red hair. She got a lot of attention. You know, I was quiet. She was more outgoing. She loved animals. She loved children. She loved to babysit. When uh, Roxine was younger, 
being that my parents kept a really close clutch on all of his kids, um, I think she resisted that, like as any normal young girl would do, you know, rebel, fight back. She ran away a couple of times at some point. I think she was about 16. She came to my parents and told them she wanted to join the circus. After that, she came and went. I saw her periodically. I learned that Roxine was working as a prostitute in the Oakland area during the time of her death and was last seen alive about five days before her body was found. And the detectives didn't have a lot to go off of. They follow up on a few other leads. They put out some flyers asking for information, but it quickly becomes a cold case. And that's where it sits until 2010. I never really felt like they pursued her case because of all the circumstances surrounding it. You know, oh, just another prostitute. I just remember at the time thinking, why aren't they doing more to find out who killed her? Maybe if they would have, things would have been different for other people. Roxine Rogash's body, when it was recovered, had a pair of pantyhose inside out on the lower part of the body. One was in her mouth, that one was wrapped around her mouth, holding the one in her mouth as a gag, and then one was found around her neck. The cause of death of that young woman was through strangulation by pantyhose. When you compare that to the items found in Joseph Naso's house and the infatuation with nylons in his photography, it seemed like a really strong link between his modus operandi and this case from 1977. As we're coming up to the end of 2010, we have approximately four months to try to get enough evidence to at least arrest Naso for one of the cases that we'd identified at that time. When the Roxine Rogash case was reopened, turned out that the pantyhose had been saved and they were intact as if they'd been found yesterday, which is amazing since it was, what, 30 plus years that the homicide had occurred. When they did the initial testing on the nylons around the neck, they could not come up with a positive DNA match on Joe Naso. But in the late fall, just about the very end of 2010, we got a result on that murder weapon. It was DNA of Judith Naso, the wife at the time of Joseph Naso. We believe that Judy Naso's DNA was at the crime scene because the pantyhose belonged to her. Joe Naso had removed them from the house, and he used them to strangle Roxanne Rogash. And Judy's DNA was on it because they hadn't been washed. They were dirty. We know we're on the right track. But as far as prosecuting it in a court, it's just it was not enough to support a prosecution of Joseph Naso for murder. The next thing they look at is the pantyhose Roxine was wearing. They find evidence of semen on the pantyhose. DNA analysis done of that, and that semen from the pantyhose she's wearing comes back to Joseph Naso. So finding out that his DNA is at the crime scene, that was a great moment. We were really hoping the hard work of all the people in the task force team was going to pay off. But I knew that proving that Naso was responsible for these crimes was going to be tough. The Yuba cases had all of the photos and all of the writings. The Contra Costa case was definitely the weakest of the four. And then our case had the DNA evidence. But individually, all four cases are relatively weak as far as prosecuting a murder goes. And on April 11th, 2011, Joseph Naso Lauder County Jail. It was seven in the morning, it was cold. There's still a little bit of snow on the ground up there in the Sierras. Joseph Naso is due to be released from the El Dorado County Jail. As far as he knew, he was walking out a free man. 
in his mind, he'd gotten away with it. And he was going to go about his day. He did seem genuinely surprised when three detectives approached him outside the jail and told him that he was under arrest for multiple counts of murder. I still remember his look at me as we walked up to him, where you could see that kind of glimmer of recognition that whatever his plans were for that day were about to change drastically. So the interrogation of Joseph Naso took place over about eight hours in the interrogation room of the Marin County Sheriff's Office. The goal being not only having Joseph Naso confess to the four cases he was under arrest for, but also hopefully identifying the other six cases on the list to give closure to those cases and those families and those victims. So I'm interrogating Joseph Naso, and I show him the list of 10. And I asked him, Joe, what is this list? What does this mean to you? At first, he says, you can't prove anything from that. That's just a list of places. It doesn't even necessarily mean that I wrote it. Then he says, it's a list of old girlfriends. And then you know, I go through the list. I go through the girls. And Joe's only real response is, that's just not something I can talk about, I can go into right now. I, I don't want to talk about it. In addition to showing him the list of 10, we bring in the photos taken from a safety deposit box. He's looking at a, a woman who is at best passed out or more likely deceased after he's murdered her. I vividly remember seeing him smile as he's looking at his work and kind of look almost longingly at the photo. But he wasn't going to tell us what the meaning was behind those photos. I was approached in the Nassau case by the prosecutor because they were aware that I had done research on sexually sadistic serial killers. So what I was to do was to try to understand what was the motivation for the behaviors and how does one account for some of the very odd findings in this case. I was sent photographs seized during searches, a diary that was characterized as a rape diary, and I was sent the police interviews of the defendant. The list of 10 for Naso is just an aid to his memory. So he doesn't forget his achievements what he's done. He wants to be able to reminisce about his past, and he fears that he may forget one of them. That's true also of some of the materials he kept from victims, which I'd call trophies, and some mementos like newspaper clippings about the woman's death. These all help to elicit a vivid recollection of what took place. And because he went to great effort and trouble and took great risk committing those crimes, he reasons that he might as well enjoy it in his older age and be able to relive it, think about it. If someone is selectively taking photos of women who appear dead or unconscious and keeping those photos as a collection, there is a reason for it. They suggest a sexual proclivity toward women who are powerless to respond. And that's the essence of a diagnosis widely misunderstood called necrophilia. The characteristic that I've observed among those who are necrophiles is that it's not only corpses that attract them. A mannequin attracts them as well. An unconscious victim attracts them as well. And what those all have in common is that the sexual object isn't responsive, isn't resisting, isn't objecting, isn't rejecting. And that provides a kind of power to the man who finds that sexier than a responsive partner. He can do as he wishes without protest.
I don't think it's a coincidence that there are 10 mannequins in Naso's garage. I think they represent his victims to him. That exhibit must have felt to him like his garden of triumph, that this allows him to feel that he can relive having all of them, possessing all of them all at once. His display of them, the way he dressed them, makes me think it's pretty likely he rubbed or touched them for sexual pleasure. The interrogation of, of Joseph Nasa was incredibly frustrating. I mean, it was, it was like eight hours. I was pretty beat by the end of it. I fancied myself as a pretty good interrogator, and it just, it was not, all, all of my best techniques, it was not working. Trying to appeal to, you know, a sense of justice or a sense of closure or empathy for the victims or their families just did not resonate with him at all. At one point, I, I talked to him about what kind of effect this would have on his children, his two adult sons, and that, you know, if he were to come clean and apologize and confess and help us find closure, you know, that can show some goodness in him. And he kind of looked at me after I said that and said, that's pretty good. And then that was it. I could see his eyes just kind of wall off. And, you know, nothing I was going to say after that point was going to get him to tell me what I wanted to know. Joe Naso makes a decision to represent himself. And I believe that Joe Naso is cheap. He never paid for anything. He made all the women pay for hotels or food or dinners. But that's the kind of person he was financially, cheapskate. He believes he's going to win, and he's not going to have to spend a whole lot of money to beat the charges. And he even makes a statement that nobody knows the case better than he does, which we found kind of ironic. Mr. Naso started off being fairly cordial. He started uh, by referring to me by my then rank. He referred to me as Sergeant Brown. As he got more and more frustrated, I went from Sergeant Brown to Detective Brown to just Brown. He would pose a question to me and say, OK, Brown, you call this a rape journal. Why do you call it a rape journal? And I said, because you wrote in here, I raped her, I ravaged her, I had to hold her down, I had to knock her out. And that's when he makes this comment about, to him, rape is courting or wooing a woman. The rape diary just landed like a ton of bricks in that courtroom. When the descriptions came out, with him detailing what he did, how he sexually assaulted woman after woman, young girl after young girl. And Naso tried to explain it away, saying the word rape didn't really mean rape. That's just kind of guy talk. The word rape is his way of explaining, hey, I made out. I basically was able to have sex with a girl. A man who repeatedly raped women and who at times strangled them to death and who sought images of women seeming to be unconscious, dead, or bound. One would have very good evidence that Naso is sexually sadistic. And then during the trial, we identified two other cases from the list we could get a conviction for multiple life sentences if we we're able to prove these cases. There was a lot of publicity about the Joe Naso trial developing. And a retired Marin County Sheriff's detective realized that she had interviewed Joe Naso back in 1981 in a homicide of a woman that was found dumped in Marin County. I am the daughter of 
Sharia Patton, who died over 30 years ago, she was murdered. I had moved to Lake Tahoe. She was still in LA. So when she wanted to retire, she wanted to move up and live with me. This was way back in the late 70s. We loved each other and we were really, really good friends. But when she moved up to Tahoe, I had my own life at that point. In the meantime, I met someone and I got married. And so it was a big problem when she moved up here. It really got to my husband. I guess we all lived together for about a year. And then my husband said, we have to move. And he went and told her, well, she didn't take it very well. And then a couple of days later, I came home from work and she was gone, absolutely gone, taking her clothes. Everything was out of there. She left me just a little note. And she said that she was going away. I don't even know where she's going. And thinking that, oh, she'll be back. You know, she's coming right back. Well, then it got to be New Year's. It's my birthday. She never called. So now I'm really getting worried. I had already gone to bed this night and I got a phone call. And so it was about 10, 15, because it was the 10 o'clock news that my distant relative had seen this composite picture of my mother. And they were just asking if anyone knew her. They had found her in uh, Tiburon, in that Bay Area. They had found her in a black plastic bag and she'd been strangled and had washed up on the shore. When the body was identified and family contacted, they discovered that she had lived at 839 Leavenworth in San Francisco. The investigators made contact with the building manager of that location, and that turned out to be Joe Naso. Joe Nasa was interviewed and denied ever meeting or knowing Sharia Patton. They can't tie Naso to the case at all, and so the case now goes cold. After I found out my mother had passed, I didn't hear anything back from the sheriff's department. All I got was the ashes, and they were mailed to me. And so life just went on, and I didn't hear anything for all these years. All of a sudden, 30 years later, these detectives came to my house, and they showed me some pictures. I had photos with me of girls, different girls dressed in different types of clothing, posed by Joe Naso trying to identify these women, if Rusty Hecker had ever seen them before or heard about them through her mother. There was a picture of this girl. She looked like she was about 16. And all she had on was this rabbit fur coat. It's gray with a little black in it. I spotted that jacket right away because I wore that same jacket for 10 years. My mom and I had gone shopping in Tahoe, and we saw these fur jackets in the window. And we went in, and I said, oh, I want this one. And then she says, oh, I want it too. So she bought us both the same jacket. We surmised that when she murdered Sharia, Joe Naso cleared out the apartment, taking all the belongings, the jewelry, clothing with him. And at some point, he had a young lady put on the rabbit jacket and take photographs of her. The only way that he would have had possession of that jacket is if he had killed Saria Patton. So Joe Naso is dressing a young woman to take photographs of her using the fur rabbit jacket of the woman that he murdered. So now we've added number seven on the list. 
we had him at this point linked to five of the entries on his list. During the trial, actually, it was the day after Sarah Dillon's brother testified about his sister on the stand. We are notified by the Department of Justice DNA lab that there is a hit on a skull that is found by the Nevada County Sheriff's Department. We had worked with a cold case detective. He recalled a case where skeletal remains were found alongside a highway in Nevada County. They have no idea who the skull belongs to. They take it to the Department of Justice to do a DNA test to see if they're able to get a hit in their database of a possible missing person. They get a hit on the skull that matches the DNA of Sarah Dillon. I believe that she flew into the Sacramento airport from Hawaii to attend a Bob Dylan concert in tracing her steps. We believe she would have come across the path of Joe Naso, who would have been traveling from Oakland to Yuba City through Highway 113, which is very close to the Sacramento airport. He had been possibly visiting his ex-wife, Judith, who still lived in Oakland at the time and he was heading home. Sarah was known as a hitchhiker and was unafraid to get into strangers' vehicles. So we believe that he picked her up in that area and at some point had killed her. Each homicide was unique as far as trying to draw the relationship between the victim and Joe Naso, but when you show the totality of his actions, how he treats women, how he killed women, you could see the pattern come forward to show that Joe Nasa was responsible for these four deaths that we prosecuted, and then the additional two deaths that showed the same pattern. If he hadn't, in 2008, gone and shoplifted alcohol and, and groceries, he wouldn't have been on anybody's radar. He'd be another undiscovered serial killer. If an alert probation officer had not found that list, Joe Naso would have got away with murder. It's like he ripped a piece of my heart out. It's just gone. I miss her smile. I miss her, I miss her, just, just looking at her face and her smile. And it took my trust away, because I lost faith in, in the people in this world. Because did somebody like that can do something to Tracy? She was the most lovable, easygoing person. And it was just crazy to think somebody could do that to her. Naso is still a piece of my life, a life that we would have shared together as we grew old together. I feel like he took away any opportunity for us to have a happy ending, you know. I could never forgive him for what he's done, not just to my mother, but to the lives of many people. All the families, parents, brothers and sisters of those people, those girls that died so senselessly, so awfully. So you have the six that we know of, the, the four more on the list of 10, which means there are four families who don't have answers. There are four families who don't know what happened to their loved one. And I just can't imagine the pain and the hole that you must feel in your heart not knowing what happened to your daughter or to your sister. Then you have the rape diaries. And those rape diaries indicate so much pain and suffering and trauma that dozens upon dozens of women suffered. And Naso got away with this for a long time, for decades and decades. Identifying the four remaining victims from the list of 10 is extremely important to me. Those four remaining entries represent women. 
that are, are victims of a horrible crime. And I think they deserve some justice. I would love to be able to go into San Quentin and interview Mr. Naso. Hopefully I will get that chance, but I don't know if he'd ever admit it.